When I go out to my um, mailbox, I look at my email, the question kids ask me the most is how do I get ideas for my books? And that's because I think most of you are writing your own stories, or if you haven't learned to write yet, you're drawing pictures that tell a story. So I would like to tell you how I got the idea for the three little dassies. I'm going to draw you a picture. I brought my easel with me. And then I have a few words to say about your creativity. And the whole thing should take about 20 minutes. And I am um, looking forward to meeting you all in person when we have the book signing. And if you have any questions, wait until then, and then I can give you my complete attention for any of those questions. When I was in kindergarten, if you went into my class and said, what do you want to be when you grow up, I would say, children's book illustrator. And now that it's my job, it's even better than I thought. We do a lot of traveling, first with the orchestra, and then sometimes for fun. And we have been to Africa, I think, seven times in the last eight years. And we were on a trip to Namibia, and we were bird watching. And bird watching is like when you get up in the morning and you go out in a little vehicle with a, with a guide who knows the birds of the region. You get your binoculars out and you spot all the different birds. And I think we see about 300 every time we go over there, but they're all different than the ones in the United States. So we were bird watching, and of course you see all the other big wild mammals as well in Africa. But we were at this beautiful place called Trifelfontaine, which is a world heritage site because of these rock carvings in the cliffs. And there's also a spring there, and people have been coming for 14,000 years to this place because of the spring, and they did the rock carvings, but also birds come there. So we were sitting in, at this little spring, and we noticed all these little creatures um, kind of popping their heads up above the rock, and as we were sitting there watching birds and being very calm, then they'd come a little bit closer, and we they'd sunbathe. And they were the cutest little animals. They're about as big as a loaf of bread, and they looked like a cross between a koala and a woodchuck. But actually, they're very, when I looked in my guidebook, they're very far from a koala or a woodchuck. They're in their own class. They're like a branch of the family tree of animals that just ended, and their closest relatives are the elephant and the aardvark. And they, have, they were very cute, and they live in family groups. And I noticed that they'd be all relaxed, and then there's all these great raptors, which would be eagles and hawks, um, flying over. And there was one that was huge. It was over six feet in the wingspan. So that means if like a big man laid on the floor, that's how wide its wings would be. And it would come over, and you'd see the shadow, and then boop, 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 all the rock dassies would go into their little homes in the rocks. And um, I sometimes use the word rock dassies, which is the Afrikaans word for them. Dassies kind of means small, furry animal. And, but they're really, their scientific name is hyrax. So they would go into their holes. And we enjoyed watching them. And we also enjoyed seeing the sand elephants and a leopard and the rhinos and some of the other fantastic animals that you see in Africa. And on the way home in the plane, I'm always really sad because it's so beautiful over there. And I said, oh, you know, I loved all the animals, but you know, I keep remembering those funny little rock dassies. They're so chubby. They're like little pigs, and they live in rock houses, just like the three little pigs. And then I went, ah, three little pigs. Maybe this could be a version of, an African version of the three little pigs. And I don't know if everybody knows the story of the three little pigs, but it's about three little pigs that go off to make their way in the world. And the first one makes his house of straw. The second one makes his house of sticks, and the third one makes this house of rocks. It takes a long time to make that rock house. And then the big bad wolf comes along and blows the straw house in. That little pig gets in with the one in the stick house, and then he blows the stick house in, and there's a lot of huffing and puffing going on. And then finally, they go into the stone house, and that's when the, the wolf has a problem. He cannot blow the rock house in, and the moral of the story, I guess, is build a strong house. But even more so, it's about doing things well. I would like to do the drawing for you, and it takes me an hour just to do an inch when I'm at home. It takes me a year to do a book. So I brought, and I use watercolors and little pencils and, and paintbrushes, but today I'm going to use my markers so that I can make it in like five minutes. And then it will, I just have a few more words to say for you, and then it will be time for the book signing. So I have my 
hedgehog purse. <laughs> and very lightly, I'm going to sketch out. I would normally do this with a pencil, but since you will not be able to see the pencil from the way back, way, way back, I'm going to just do the shapes with this gray marker. And these markers are great. They um, have thick on one end and thin on the other end. And they're called Prismacolor ones. And you can get them at the art store. So if you're the kind of person who's an artist and you want to practice, this would be a very good present to ask for for a birthday. So I'm making a heart shape. And it's kind of a flat heart. And that's going to be her head. I'm going to draw um, what, either Mimby, Timby, or <laughs> Mimby, one of their little, a, self, a little portrait of hers. Not a self-portrait, a portrait. So I'm starting with a heart shape. And then I'm going to go halfway down, and now three quarters of the way down, and I'm going to make a square, only when I make the square, I'm going to round the edges, and that's going to be her little nose. And that's the part of her that looks a little bit like a koala, because the koalas have a kind of a funny nose like that. And then I, gotta stand, I have to stand in front, because otherwise it will be distorted, but I'm just going to make two little circles for her eyes, and that's how it's going to start with the eyes, then I can move over to the side once that's blocked in. And now her mouth is a little bit like a kitty or a bunny mouth. It just goes down a little bit here, where the, and then where the top lips, it splits so that she has a little smile. And then this is her fur that comes up, and so I'll put her hat on, and it kind of looks like a log on top of her head, but that's what they do in their tradition is where their hats in the shape of a cattle's horns. And then they, the Herrera women usually have a beautiful pin in the, in the center, so I'm going to make her pin look like a, a flower. So I noticed that they had a lot of pride in their pins, and they complimented their dresses. So I got the feeling that maybe that they were passed down from mother to daughter, and then they took great care picking out the different patterns of their clothes. And then they made them by hand, because I, the ladies told me. And the young Herrera women told me that uh, theirs were the latest style. <laughs> and <laughs> the other ones. And then they told me not to do the patchwork ones that you see sometimes in the, in the guidebooks, because they, those consider those as not as nice. So I thought, that was an, I thought it was pretty cool that they did that. And now she has an ear on each side of her head. So I, what kind of shape would that be? Kind of like a little shell on each side. And then her chin is right here under her mouth. And then this part is just the fur that comes down. And then I'll draw her beads. And the beads were really cool. They were kind of the color of terracotta, which is like a color of a flower pot. It's kind of reddish brown. And these beads look, were carved out of wood. And I didn't ask too much about them. Because, you know, these people were so hospitable that if you asked them about something, they probably would just take them off and give them to you. And I didn't want to do that because I didn't know if they were, you know, hand carved by someone or what the story was. So I just, um, I thought maybe I'd see some at the airport or I could ask someone and I never found someone that I really could ask about them. Now I'm going to um, work on her eyes, I guess, would be the next thing, and I'll take out my black. Um, when most animals, I mean, if you've got fur, then the fur can't go right to your eye. There has to be like a little, a little area of skin right before the fur meets the, the eye. So if you look at your dog or your cat, you can see that it, it looks like that. And birds, too, before the feathers, they have like a little, so I put that in, and then you know, her nose kind of pokes out, so I'm just going to make a little line right there to show that her nose is coming out. That's hard to, hard to explain. Then above her eyes, there's a little white patch, and I'm going to make kind of a shaggy stroke because I want that to look like fur, and that's a little bit of a whitish or a lighter color than the rest of her, her face but it kind of makes her look like she's kind of interested in what's coming next when she has uh, her, her eyebrows in there. And of course, animals don't have eyebrows, but human beings do. So if by bunching up the fur, it could be on any kind of animal, really. You, it kind of makes it look like eyebrows, and it's a way that 
when I draw my animal characters, I can kind of give them human-like emotions, is bunching up the fur there to make it look like eyebrows. And then right underneath her eye, I'm going to make a little line to kind of make her look a little bit worried. And then her pupils. Now, if you, this is of what our eyes are made out of. There's the black part in the center is the pupil. And then the part around that, for human beings, it could be blue, gray, green, uh, hazel, brown. And with a dassy, it's brown. And that's called your iris. And when you do the pupil, I think I'm going to make her kind of looking up towards the sky. She has very big pupils. And I'm going to make a, leave one little white dot in the pupil. And that's just the reflection of light in her eye. And if you look at my eyes or you look at your neighbor's eyes, you'll see there's a little white sparkle of light there. And that's just our eye because they're so shiny, they reflect it. And if we turn off all the lights, we wouldn't see any sparkles in anybody's eyes because you need the light to reflect it. But when you're doing your drawings, that's a way to make your drawing look a little bit realistic is to make that little white dot. And you'll see even cartoonists do that. So I'm just right now, before I forget, I'm going to make her brown eyes. I've got a really good color brown for that. And this, is, this would be her, the iris of her eye right there. So, and then I'm, I haven't quite finished her eyes yet because I want to also do a line right above, and it just kind of points up to it like a, a dot in the center of her forward, forehead, and that makes her look a little bit worried. Can you see how that really changes her look? So that's how subtle it is when we draw our drawings, and that's why when I do my sketching, I use a pencil and an eraser so I can get it just right. And here's a really good tip for some of the older kids that like to draw. If you're doing a drawing, and all of a sudden it looks a little bit strange and you don't like it and you don't know why, you can take that picture and put it in a mirror and it's like seeing it for the first time because everything is reversed. So that's a good trick to use. I do it all the time. If something looks a little funny, I'll put it in the mirror. Or you could just hold your piece of paper up through the light and you know, away from, so the picture's away from you and you can see it reversed too. And then all of a sudden you'll see where your mistake might be. Now here's her nostrils. So I finished her eyes now, and then I'm going to make this shaggy stroke here to show that it's fur, because if she was a reptile, she wouldn't have that. <coughs> or human being, we have mostly skin there, and then where her ears join. And I, th I think I'm making the fur on her forehead go a little bit lower. So I'm adjusting my picture a little bit. At first I made the heart too high up, and now I'm adjusting it a little bit. And artists love to do that, just adjust all the time. Some people get their sketches to the publisher and they then do the finishes and they look exactly like they, their sketches, but I always like a, to leave a little bit for when I'm doing the finishes and I change them a little bit, because that makes it fun. So now she's getting, oh yeah, here's her chin, and then here's the, her neck down here. And now I'm going to take um, a gray and I'm going to show you a little bit about shading. So she looks pretty flat right now, like a more like a cartoon. And I'm going to use, now if I was using a pencil, I could put my pencil like this and make it on the side and do my shadow shading. But I'm just going to use this light gray marker and just go all around her head. So if you can imagine doing this with a pencil, that's something you could do at home. And then right under her chin, I'm going to do it. And I think it's going to give her more of a, three-dimensional look. And then a little bit up here where her forehead goes back. And now you're going to really tell it on her hat. This is the underside of her hat. So that looks like it's more shadowy. And then if I was at home, I'd even do it darker right on the edge like that. And that might take quite a long time to do. And then under her fl the flower, because let's say the sun is shining above here, then everything on the underside would have a shadow on it. And then I can also work on her eye a little bit, because most mammals do not have their eyes right on their head. They're indented a little bit so that they're protected, like if they're running through some branches or something that the branches don't get in their eye. And that's the same with humans. Our eyes are like um, dented in a little bit. So I'm going to put a shadow right there to show that. And she's looking kind of cute. And then she has a lot of uh, kind of some dark fur right above her nose, which is what Dassies look like. 
and then I'm making her, n her nose gray, and then her ears are a really soft gray color. And if someone asked me, now, what kind of noise does a dassy make? And I wasn't going to say, but now I think I will because people were curious. But at, at our camp, there'd be a lot of tourists there. We weren't all watching birds. Some people were going to see the animals, too. And I was, too, really. But, and in the middle of the night, we'd hear this, like, shriek. It sounded like the worst leopard screamer or something. And it turns out it's these. I don't know what they're doing up there. And, and they were up in the roof and making this shrieking noise. But then they also make kind of a little purring noise, I guess, when they're happily in the mountainside. But <laughs> they, they love to make that shrieking noise. And I, so there's her beads. Oh, she's, and now their fur, they say it's like a brindled color. And to me, brindled would mean kind of different colors of brown. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just sketch in really quickly her brown fur, and I'll leave some white spaces, and then I'll use another color of brown to add into that. So, you know, to make it really look like a dassy. Because like some animals are like one color, that's their color, but others have lots of colors in their fur, and that's what the rock dassy has. And see, I can go over where I've shaded the brown, and it will um, just look a little bit darker where I've put the gray in. And hopefully that will give her a, a look like she's more natural. And then right around her mouth, it get, the fur gets kind of lighter. So we'll do that. And let's see if I got another color brown here. I've got, I'm gonna take out this brown that I used for her eyes and maybe fill in a little bit of the, where the white is so that you can see she's got a brindle coat. And I had to make all the three sisters girls because I wanted them to parachute down. I had to think of some use for those long dresses. And in my family, <laughs> in my family there's three girls, and I remember we used to have big discussions on which one of the three little pigs we were. Were we the one who made the straw house, or the stick house, or the brick house, and of course, every, or the stone house. Everybody wanted to be the one who made the stone house. And now I'll do uh, her beads, which are kind of a, I'm, I don't have the right color, so I'm just gonna use this orangey color and then use a brown on top of it and see if we can come up with something that's close to the color of their beads. And oh, when you, when you meet these Herrero people, and let's say you're not looking towards the ladies that are coming towards you, but first you hear them, you hear all their dresses rustling, and then you smell this delicious smell. It's not very strong, it's not like a, a really strong perfume, but it smells almost like a powdery smell, and that's these beads. They have a, like cedar is another wood that has a odor, and I never got to find out what it, what it was. So I guess I should go back to Namibia and find out. And then her nose is darker, so I'm gonna use this darker brown for her nose. It's really more black. And the inside of her ears. Uh, she's almost done. The best part is gonna be doing this, her uh, beautiful hat. And they, a lot of the people had very bright colors on their clothes, and I, those were my favorites. Everybody had the, a more beautiful one than the next, it looked like, to me. And they were, the people spoke very good English, and they were very friendly to us. And Namibia is a very good place to go if you want to go to Africa for the first time, because it's uh, easy to find your way around. It has beautiful, kind of a deserty-like place, and lots of wildlife and huge big sand dunes and things like the well wichita plant and the euphorbias which are really interesting plants that you you find the euphorbias in other places in africa and they're kind of like the cactus of africa the euphorbias so we've got she's got a green hat and then she's going to have dots with purple in the dots and that i'm going to leave this to the bookstore and as a thank you for inviting me here today and then I think I got one more color that I can add in, which is this, where's my yellow? She's got a little bit of yellow around here. You know, see, I'm such a detailed person, I'm getting carried away, and you're probably really wanting me to get done with the picture so I could start the, 
book signing, which I can't wait to meet you all. So she's got her shawl. It gets actually these deserty like places. They're very hot in the daytime, but boy, when, when the sun goes down, all of a sudden it gets very cold. Now I've got silver here someplace for her. Her, her brooch, or is the, that's another word for pin, her beautiful pin. And then just one more thing, which is to a design on her scarf, make it like a plaid. And if I didn't bring those dolls, I would don't know what I would have done for the borders because I used the beautiful fabric that I saw. And it's different than we have in the United States. It's kind of almost like a retro calico. And I brought as much as I could back. But in other parts of Africa, there's different kinds of um, fabrics. And an artist should always sign their work. So there's my signature. And then one last thing about that, I'm going to put October. 2010, and that's, um, I want to point out to you guys, children especially, that learning to draw is just like riding a bike or uh, what would be an skateboarding. It's just the more you practice at it, the better that you get at it. You really don't even need a teacher. You can just practice, practice, practice. And if you did a drawing in the next couple of days, and put it in a drawer, and then practiced, you know, every couple times a week, and then around Easter time, 2011, did a drawing then, and put them by side by side, you'd be amazed at how much better you've gotten just for practicing. So even me, even though I've been an illustrator for all these years, I still always think I'm going to be a little bit better the next time I do a book. So that's my goal, is to always try to improve it, makes it more interesting that way too. And if you look at your finger or your thumb, this is the part about your creativity. You can see that there's little lines there, and that's your fingerprint. And do you know that no one in the world has a fingerprint just like yours? You are the only one. And it's the same way with your artwork and your storytelling, that no one else has the same set of experiences that you've had growing up and the same set of talents. So when you draw something, it's totally unique. And I really, this came home to me one day when a teacher was at our website and she was uh, looking at the How to Draw a Hedgehog video and everybody in the class drew a hedgehog. It has directions for she drew an oval and that kind of thing. And so she, one day I got this big manila envelope. This teacher had, first of all, she'd taken a big piece of paper like the backdrop, painted it blue, and then she put white fluffy clouds made out of cotton and then she put the hedgehogs that the kids, children had drawn, painted, and then cut out. And so there were 21, 29 hedgehogs going to the left. One hedgehog was going to the right. There was one hedgehog that looked like it was alive. It was so realistic. It had the shading and everything. There was another one, pink, with long eyelashes. And someone had gone to the trouble to put sparkly eyeshadow on her. <laughs> There was another one that was like a medicine hedgehog. Its prickles were like sharply pointed and had like a little sparkle to show how sharp they were on each one. And little teeth, I noticed, little fangs on either side. And it looked like it was crouching, ready to pounce. I mean, this was a scary hedgehog. And then the other one that I really loved, each one was better than mine. Because kids' have drawings have so much pizzazz. It was like the athletic hedgehog. And instead of being low to the ground, it had long legs and muscles, biceps, triceps, <laughs> and the legs were all muscled. And it was, it was like short hair, ready to you know, get, make a basket. So when I saw those hedgehogs, I said to myself, next time I talk to children, I want to tell them about how unique their own art style is. And my challenge to you is that in the next couple of days, that you take a paper and pencil, doesn't have to be fancy, turn off the television, and just go to a place where it's a little bit quiet so you can hear your own voice, the voice that's inside of you that starts when you're drawing. All of a sudden, you start making up like where the character lives or something about the rainbow and a story starts to happen and just give yourself an hour and I think that the hour will go by very quickly and when you're done you will be very pleased with what you see there because your drawing will just unfold by itself and you will sit back and say look at the artist that I am. So thank you very much for being such a good audience and I'm looking forward to meeting you all. Thank you.